How's it going? going? Yeah, not too, not too bad, not too bad. Sorry, I just had, I think I said, my, I've been really struggling to get a hold of my a guy who's looking over my master's and he phoned me this morning and said he's got some time for me. So I just had to grab him. So sorry, I changed the time. No, nah, no bother, mate. Yeah, I missed you around the other week. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm doing a master's on um, like the green economy. So I'm just stuck reading really, really detailed books at the moment. So this is a nice light relief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. try and make it that way anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Are you in uh, Barcelona? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice one. I've been here about seven years. Oh, cool. So what uh, what uni are you studying with? I'm doing an online course at, with Bournemouth. Oh, it's cool. A, a master's in the green economy. So it's, yeah, it, this wasn't available until the pandemic. So that whole that whole world coming online has helped with certain things because I wouldn't have been able to do this otherwise. My Spanish is not good enough to do it at a uni over here. And actually, it's, it's not offered by many unis. So it's good being able to do it online. Yeah, Not that there's anything wrong with Bournemouth, but um, <laughs> I'd rather do it for Barcelona. Yeah. Bournemouth or Barcelona, yeah. Well, definitely <laughs> worse places than the both of them. So, Where are you? Uh, I'm in Manchester. All right, okay, cool. Which, which is all right. Can't complain. Um, so, yeah, thanks for getting in touch then. Well, like, obviously, you mentioned you listened to the podcast and that, and you, you thought you had some stories to tell, a bit of relevant experience. So, so tell, <laughs> yeah. tell us a bit about what you worked to back in the day. No, it was a, it was a really interesting time. It's get, I, I started in the music industry about 2003. So just when we were chatting, I was thinking, actually, that's 20 years now since I, since I started. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was, you know, trying, trying to go back to that period of time. So, so round about, round about then, um, uh, I set up a music company based in South London um, called Gallus Music. And we started initially just, you know, kind of doing the thing, touting, you know, going around some small venues, trying to find some decent bands. Um, I had another guy working with me at the time called Dylan. Um, we helped out a few bands. We were doing that for about six months. And then we um, came across a band from Glasgow called Dead Fly Bukowski. And um, we managed to get them signed to Beggar's Banquet in 2005, I think it was, 2004 or 2005. And um, they were pretty much ready to go. They're a really, really good band, really good live. They'd recorded an album and um, they sent it off to Beggar's. They had a bit of interest. We kind of took it forward from then um, and uh, they signed with Beggar's. So we kind of set up the music company properly then um, expecting some money to come in, which was clearly the wrong thing to expect back then. Um, and we also set up a, a kind of CD manufacturing company. There's a guy who's based in South London, Mike Spence, his name is, and he's really famous within this kind of um, grungy, garagey kind of, I don't know, kind of microcosm of the music industry in, in, in London. And he ran a, a CD manufacturing company, which just kind of like perennially went bust because he would spend all the money that he was getting in on his own music projects. And uh, I'd known him for years and his company was going to go bust again. And they had about 15 artists who they'd said they'd taken money from and they said they were going to do the manufacturing for them. And they didn't have enough money for it. So we decided to, to kind of take on his business, do the production for these 15, um, 15 or so bands, and then start hopefully earning a little bit of money um, manufacturing CDs, which, you know, if you think back to 2005, was not a great business idea <laughs> going into that. So we'd set up the company, we'd put a wee bit of money in, we'd had a band signed, we'd taken on the manufacturing in the hope of, you know, helping us source some bands. We thought that was a really good place to get in on the ground level um, because bands are sign signing you CDs. Of the couple of thousand CDs we listened to, I think we were interested in about five bands enough to go and see them. So that in itself gives you an idea of how much music was being created at that time. And also, I think, how poor a lot of it was. So it didn't really work from an a &R perspective and it wasn't making much money. So we kind of took concentrated a little bit more on the bands. Um, Dead Fly Bukowski were signed to Beggars. Uh, we took up another few bands and over the next couple of years, we had um, a, a, a band um, signed to a label in Germany, a band called Dutch Uncles. Um, I think I know that name, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they signed it to Petty Records in Germany and they're now, um, they've not released an album for a few years. 
um, but they're, they, they eventually signed to Memphis Industries, so they got quite a good label. Um, in the end, we had a development deal for a, a, a Canadian female artist who was fantastic um, from Atlantic. Um, and we also had a little band in Glasgow who were offered a um, singles deal from Sony, uh, but turned it down because Glasgow bands don't sign to majors. <laughs> um, so this was all about kind of 2005 to, to 2008. So um, looking back, we kind of, you know, we, we were really successful in getting interest in the bands that, that, that we were involved in, but we just didn't make that kind of financial um, or that career move that we were hoping hoping when we set up the the record label so we were concentrating on um mainly um mainly management of the bands through that period of time mm. okay so you said you moved to south london at some point then yeah I've, I, I was there i moved down to london in about the late 90s actually and it was i loved south london it was a very different music scene from north london um and you felt detached from that kind of camden um, you know, that kind of slightly North Islington kind of vibe. South London just felt very different. I mean, we were just, we were just, we were in Herne Hill, which is just outside Brixton. So our kind of, um, uh, the world that we moved in every day was much more garage and grunge and sorry, uh, garage and R&B and hip hop, you know, and then we would kind of come up to North London and it was just a completely different, completely different vibe. But it was interesting being in London, the music scene, but having a band from Manchester, uh, Dutch uncles were from Stock from Stockport, and then having a band, uh, Dead Fly Bukowski, who were from Glasgow and also another band called Pop Up from Glasgow. So we were kind of based in London, but we really had that sense of how different the music scene was in Manchester and how different it was in Glasgow and Scotland compared to London. And there was definitely some differences at, at that period of time. Hmm. So you're saying you're living in London, you know, when the whole thing is kicking off in the early noughties. Um Was it as exciting in, in Scotland as it was in London at that point? Or did they kind of catch up or was it just different? Yeah, it was, it was certainly really different. And, and what, what we noticed was that, um, most of the bands in London were really keen to get a deal and they were really keen to sign for a major. And there was lots of bands who were putting out very kind of catchy commercial pop to try and get a deal. And, you know, and they were all chasing Alan McGee around London to try and <laughs> get him to sign whoever major he was with that week. You know, you know, the, the, the story of Alan McGee walking out of Sony, walking across the road to, I think it was you know, Parlophone or something like that, and just getting exactly the same deal within half an hour of him losing the deal. Um, so there were so many bands in London chasing, chasing major record deals. And then you would come up to Manchester and... The Dutch uncles who we managed towards the end of that period, the last thing they wanted to do was sign for a major. Right. And then we would go up to Glasgow and we had a band who refused a deal from a major <laughs> on, on the, the, you know, with the, with, with the, the rationale that Glasgow bands did not sign for majors. And, you know, this was at the time of Franz Ferdinand, who were not, who were on Domino, I think, who were not on a major, but, you know, they were the band and everyone was inspired to them. And we also had, of course, Mogwai, Delgados, who were all on Chemical Underground. So there was this scene, this much more indie scene in Scotland um, compared to London. And that was really difficult being a management company whose job you felt it was to get the band a good deal um, when they would just be looking for the specific label and it not being a major. So it was it was really different. The scene in London was much more, um, well, I mean, I was gonna say hedonistic, but it wasn't, but there was very much um, a, a let's, let's, let's get a deal. Whereas in Scotland, I think, and in Manchester, I felt it was a lot more um, ab about the music. Maybe I'm being a little bit unfair because I'm not saying in any way that the musicians in London weren't about the music, but it looked like there was always an end, um, which was signing with a record label. So do you think it was a mistake that band not signing or do you think uh, they're right to stick by their principles? Yeah, well, it actually happened to us a few times. When when we um, um when we had an offer from um Deadfly Bukowski from Beggars, um uh, about a week later I got a phone call, phone call from someone from Geffen who'd said they were interested and could they have a meeting? Uh, you know, Geffen, Geffen Records, right? You know, so a huge American label 
and um, I contacted the band and said, I've got a, I've got a meeting, I'm going to go and speak to the head of A&R at Geffen, who's in London. And they said, no, there's no point, we want to sign for beggars. Right. And that was the situation we were in. I said, you know, are you sure? You, did you hear me right? So there must have been <laughs> something happening on the phone. But they said, no. Well, actually, one member of the band um, who, who, had spoken, who I spoke to said, no, we've all agreed. We want to sign the beggars. So that made it incredibly difficult to n- negotiate any kind of decent deal from Beggar's Banquet at the time, um, knowing that they were, weren't even wanting me to speak to any other labels. So that was a huge kind of mistake that maybe I should have just said, fuck it, I'm just gonna do, go and do the meeting anyway. Yeah. But, you know, I saw my job as to being exactly as you'd said there, re- represent the band. If that what they want to do is, is what you is what your job is, but I do think it was a mistake at least not taking that um, that 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 meeting. And with Pop Up, who were offered that three single deal from Sony, um, we should have taken it. There's no doubt now. Looking back, we should have taken it. And the band really wanted to sign with Chemical Underground, and they actually went in and they did some recording with them. They got really friendly with them. Um, then Chemical offered them a deal that was just nowhere near what the band were expecting. So in the end, they didn't get the kind of cool indie deal um, and they didn't get the the, the deal with the, the majors. So yeah, I think look, looking back, it was a shame that the bands uh, didn't really take those opportunities there. But, you know, they were, as I said, they were kind of all about the music and they felt like that was selling out. Mm. Yeah, fair play. And did you kind of have to throw everything into this, into the music industry kind of thing? You were like all in? Type of thing. Yeah, well, I, I I was really fortunate. Um, I I I'm kind of my late twenties. I'd left a really good job. I'd a, I had a little bit of money. Um, you know, I mean, a good job from a working class background, not a not a hundred thousand pounds working in a bank. Um, so we had a little bit of money to invest in the company. You know, a few thousand pounds we put in, and for about two years, we just really survived on a little bit of income from doing some some small kind of jobs back and back and um, you know using my experience in the past a little bit of money coming in I also ran a club in South London and um, the Half Moon in Herne Hill uh, we ran a show there every week and that would normally make us about 100 quid which was kind of the lifeblood of the business then but yeah I was in it I, I was in it full time um, for two years and it, it felt like quite a strange life because I was also the resident uh, DJ in uh, the Groucho Club which All is a right. members club in London wow. so I couldn't afford. I couldn't afford to join the club. Um, but one of the one of the guys that we knew his wife managed the Groucho Club, so I got in as the a house DJ. I had to do a couple of um, parties. I, I, I DJed for um, uh, Woody Allen at his rap party for um, I think it was Film Wimbledon about tennis, and I did another couple of gigs, and then I got my membership for the Groucho. <laughs> and uh, I was on the same. I was on the list as um, like Damien Hurst. So I think we both got we both got on we both got into the Groucho Club at the same time. Uh, he donated a painting, um, which was worth like five hundred grand, <laughs> and I and I DJed a few parties. So um, I definitely got a good side of the bargain there. But I was in that environment. We were with you know the, the members of the Groucho Club are like Chris Martin, Bono, um, all the members of Blur. So we were in there and we were kind of seeing that what you would expect if you were managing a band on a major who were doing really, really well. <laughs> and but we were and then the other side was managing bands who were really struggling. And and as a company we were really struggling. And I remember one night speaking to Alex James from Blur. Um, and uh, he was standing at the bar, we were chatting for about 10 minutes. I was telling about all the woes of being a manager for a band who didn't want to sign to major and how difficult it was. And we were chatting for 10 minutes. Um, and then just at the end, I said to him, but you know what, you know, I, I, happily, I happily buy you a, a beer. He went, oh, no, I don't drink beer if you can get me a glass of champagne. And I just realised <laughs> that the, the 10 minutes he'd been listening to me, hadn't listened to a single word that we'd said. But that was kind of, that, that summed up the life that, that, that we had as running the music company, but also kind of being in this world where you were seeing uh, the success. But it was also quite a good place to take some young bands. You know, we had the view in there. Um, the band from Dundee, who I'm sure you know, we had some of our bands down, um, and you know we were taken for a night out there. And you know one of the bands we were quite keen on, we were in there playing pool. Um, they've got a big snooker table up the top, and um, uh, Noel Gallagher was in there. He was having his his stag party. Right. So he came in. 
so he came in, he had a few games of pool with the band, the, the, the band that we had, and then he invited the boys to come and join his stag party. So they were a great band, never made anything, but they had one fantastic story <laughs> from being down in London, ending up on the party. But yeah, ending up on that stag party. But yeah, so as I said, it was, it was, it was all in. Um, there, was this, there was the kind of enjoyment and the success from being a member of a club that you hoped to get into by having success as a manager. Um, but we never really quite quite got there, but we were, we were able to have some some fun times doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, just kind of like break down like what you're doing. So you, reading what you sent me, it kind of said you were A&R. So for someone that doesn't know much about that kind of, what was your job in terms of A&R? So from around about 2003, we were actively looking for bands. So we were going out and the first, between 2003, 2005, I was working and, uh, uh, you know, a normal nine to five job. And it was a case of doing your nine to five, coming home, having a shower, grabbing a bite to eat and then going out and going to three or four different gigs uh, a night. And that's why London was so good because you could do that. And we would do that maybe four or five nights a week. And then on the Friday night, we were running our own club in London. So any of the bands that we'd seen or we wanted to see again, uh, or we were interested, or they could bring a big following and we liked them, we could get them there. So it really was just trying to find the bands that were, that you thought had the potential to do really well in terms of being signed by either a, a good indie label or a major, um, and then helping them, you know, supporting them musically. Um, which was a big part of the role that we enjoyed and did in this, you know, right from you know, trying to broaden their influences to uh, other types of music or other types of bands, which you wouldn't have known about. Um, and then going to the record labels, playing them the music, inviting them to the gigs, getting them interested in the band, and then hopefully getting an offer and taking it forward. So, you know, the real, I think the real, the fun, the most fun thing you can do in the music industry, I think, is A&R. And it's not difficult, but what is difficult is to get a band that your record label are going to support past your first or second album. And, you know, that's what happened with Dead Fly Bukowski, for example. The first album sold, I don't know, 8,000 copies. And that was it. There was no opportunity for anything else to happen. And that was really tough. And you see that when you look at the amount of bands that were signed around about that period. You know, there was a new band out every week and they were there they were pushed they had a couple of singles and then the kind of journey was over for them so you know mm. there were a lot of good bands at that period that, that that didn't last past you know 2007 2008 for for whatever reason you know and certainly one reason is that there's an initial interest from a label and then there's not enough support um, for them for them going forward but that's the core role of uh, an ENR, and and it's it, you know it's the one it's the one thing that I miss uh, is that ability just to, to go to gigs to see gig bands and think you can help them and you know I said it might just be a simple thing from improving their stage presence looking at their set list right through to you know proper developing when we signed them um, the headlines they were only 17 they got their record deal at 20 and you know they're still going but just to work with kids who are just so raw and just see that talent is you know a real um a, a real pleasure of being an A&R and that's, that's the real um, that's the real benefit and, and the real kind of wonder of being an, an A&R is that opportunity to work with really young bands and unfortunately we were just at the period where it was all about signing a band that sold records and the labels were just not interested to support bands. Okay right um, yeah it was kind of that feeling I mean, I've had that feeling when watching bands. Obviously, I'm not in the music industry, but where it's like, you know, no one's no one's really heard of them. It's kind of a small crowd, and you're thinking, wow, this band are going to do something. Did you have moments like that where you're like, I've got to get involved with this band? Yeah, we had moments like that. Yeah, and um, probably three or four bands that we saw, and we just had to grab them afterwards and say, you know, can we can can we help you? One time, the band were just had just signed management. Um, another time the band had just let go of their management and were actively looking around. So yeah, you just had like had to constantly be on your, you know, you had to constantly be on your game. Um, uh, you know, you would we, we would try and see who had just let the management go to see if we could we could we could support them. Um, but yeah, it was um it was it was difficult, but 
that's the wonder of going to a gig. Just you know, you knew that at the end of that, it it could have been something that that, that changed, um, not just your life, but the the life of the the people who were on stage. You know, that was the real fascination of it. I think you know that the, the fact that you could. I'm not. A, I don't. I'm not a musician, but just that ability to get involved and support really creative people was what drove me to to get involved in in the music industry and in A and R. Hmm. was thinking I could bring my kind of organisational skills and my management skills to, to creative people who unquestionably need it <laughs> and, and and take their career forward. And like what kind of, how how would you get informed about these bands? Like obviously you can't have been totally random all the time, like who would be informing your decisions on what gigs to go to and stuff? Yeah, well, that that's, that, that's such a good question because there was a pack mentality um in in london and you would hear that there was a band that was hot and you would know that five or six a and r were after them and um we tried to avoid that you know we tried to just to be a bit more random go out and see bands and venues that that maybe that we knew that the a and r guys didn't go to all the time um and we used to ask a lot of the bands who they play with that they like you know and that's how we we discovered dead fly bukowski in glasgow um People were saying there's a great band playing in Glasgow. You should go and see them. So it was, it, it was a little bit of that randomness, and perhaps that wasn't the best way to to do it because there was a kind of um, there was a a group of bands that were pushing towards getting signed, but all the big management companies were after them, and we just never really felt that we wanted to be in that position. We kind of felt like we needed a band to want to be managed by us rather mm. than us trying to kind of persuade a band that, you know, they were better off with us than they were some other management companies. But yeah, there was a lot of, you know, um, following who the a &R, the main a &R guys that we were, you were after, speaking to them, asking who they were interested in and going to see them. But as I said, we tried to be more proactive than, than reactive. Right. So you, you wouldn't want to be in a position where like you're trying to sell yourself kind of thing. Yeah, there's all there's always there's always going to be an element of that, absolutely. But yeah, we we were just much more about the passion. We had to feel really passionate about a band rather than just thinking that they were going to get a deal, um, and get involved in them that way. I think we were too, we were we were really about the music and supporting the bands to kind of feel like we had wanted to do that. I mean, you know, we knew that a lot of other management companies did that, um, but that wasn't really what we wanted to do. And say so, like. What about the whole general scene at that point? Like, what bands on music like excited you personally around that time? Well, I mean, you know, it was an absolutely fantastic time for music, and um, you know, I'm I'm kind of Brit pop era, so you know, I, I I grew up really my kind of formative years are properly in the kind of Brit pop scene '88, you know, through to about '94, um, but there was a real resurgence, I think, of British music ten years later, um, and. Saying that, you know, a lot of my favourite bands at the time were American. You know, I loved The Strokes. I loved Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. The National are a fantastic band. Arcade Fire. You know, so there was a really, really good, solid musical base coming from the States. But in Scotland, you know, we had like... So we had a different set, you know, Scotland had a very different set of bands, I think, from, from, the, from the UK. So we had like Biffy Clyro who were signed to Beggar's Banquet. I can tell you a few stories about that. Um, uh, but we also had kind of Mogwai and the Delgados and a band called Aberfeldy. And we had that kind of slightly, you know, teenage fan club. We had that slightly more kind of West Coast American melodic strand to, to, to music in the early 2000s, which didn't really exist in, in, in North England and um, London to the same extent so we were kind of heavily involved in, in, in that scene in, in Glasgow and then you're thinking about the kind of like the UK bands but we absolutely loved Block Party and when we were doing the CD manufacturing we were listening to about I don't know, maybe album 25 that day we'd always listen to the albums on a Friday and uh, we'd listen to the songs and then we'd kind of say we want to follow them up and um, unbeknown to me one of my business partners put on the new block party album and it just started and we just had it starts with like a, it's an amazing um, drum beat and it just slowly builds up to the vocal and I remember the hairs in my back of my neck rising because I thought it was one of the unsigned bands that we had <laughs> in our pile so I was like and, and I just said I took a big breath and I said to Dylan I said Dylan who's this and he went 
oh, it's a new Block Party album. And I just sunk like a hundred <laughs> feet into the floor. Um, so I, I thought they were a fantastic band. And yeah, we really liked uh, Maximal Park and Future Heads. And we, we were, at, at, when we were managing Dutch Uncles, because they were so young, they were 17, 18, they, were, they could just reel off 20, 30 bands that they heard of that you'd never heard of in the last week. So we were really kind of exposed to that really wide scene, whereas maybe we were getting a wee bit more mature. Um, and and the types of bands that we were we were like that, that that we were that we were involved in, but yeah, much broader I think than a lot of the kind of management companies who were based in London, just because of our kind of geographic connections to Manchester, um, and to and to Glasgow. And you know, I always had a few bands on here that have said Glasgow is a bit special, a special place to play. Was it obviously quite a passionate group of people up there? Yeah, I, I think him. I, I mean, my favourite musical city in, in the UK is Manchester, um, but I think Manchester and Glasgow were really similar. And I think there was a there was a real authenticity about the bands from that place, and also the fans and the venues. You know, and I, I really feel that there was a very there was a genuine music scene in those cities. And, and as I said about London, I just I always felt there was a, there was a little bit of a I kind of, it was it was kind of shiny in, in London, but I didn't think there was the depth. Um, and, you know, I knew there were a lot of bands who you could have just picked up in, in London and put them in Manchester or Glasgow, and they would have seemed like Manchester and, 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 and or Glaswegian bands. And those are the ones that loved coming to Glasgow and Manchester because they could see, the crowd could see that they were genuine. I remember um, Dead Fly Bukowski were on the tour, uh, on the Gonzo tour, MTV Gonzo tour in 2005. And um, they had quite a lot of big bands that were going around the country, but they played the bar fly in Glasgow and um, Dead Fly Bukowski were, um, were on that bill for Glasgow. And um, we were waiting at the venue, up pulled the massive MTB Gonzo bus and out walked um, Alex, is it Alex Zane. Mm. Um, and, you know, he was chatting to everyone. And then right behind it was uh, uh, one of the bands that were on the list assigned to a major. And they had this massive big black truck, you know, and they all came out in their nice looking clothes and they went in to, to do their to do their sound check. And then we saw them about two hours later and they'd all changed into black suits with black ties, black jackets. They were called um, The Departure. They were called The yeah, Departure. Yeah, I've had yeah. Uh, the singer on here. Really, really, yeah, yeah I've not yeah. listened to that episode. I'll have to go back, but it was amazing. See, so they were all kind of they were London arriving, and Roddy, the lead singer of Dead Fly Bukowski, um, got out a taxi carrying his amp, and that was his transport. And <laughs> not only was he wearing the clothes that um, he was going to wear that night on stage, he was wearing the clothes that he went to bed in the <laughs> night before, you know. And that for me just really summed up the difference between that kind of Glasgow music scene and what was happening in in London. Very different places, but you know, still 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 very musical. But it always felt, you know, going to a gig at King Tut's or the Barrowlands always just felt that little bit special. And uh, you know, and it's interesting hearing you say that because I, I I I know that because I'm from Glasgow, but when you hear other people saying it about your city, then you know you do realise that there was something special there. But there was a great scene outside outside um, Glasgow as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go up to Dundee, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Edinburgh was just starting to have a really good music scene around about 2004, 2005. You know, kind of Frightened Rabbits were about that period of time. Um, you know, and that all led into, you know, how, how good the Edinburgh music scene was five, ten years later. So, yeah, it was... It, it felt very different um, being at a gig in, in Glasgow than it did in, in other parts of the country. And you mentioned The View, and you said you've got a bit of a story there. What was the connection with you guys? And I was on the train coming back from a gig in Glasgow, and um, my mate Alex phoned me, and he said, um, I've just been speaking to the manager of The View, um, who are from Dundee, and he said the band have got to go down to London on Monday and sign their uh, publishing deal. Well, I think it was Warner Chapel. And I was like, all right, wow, that's fantastic. And he said, but the band, the manager can't go down, but he doesn't really want the band down there without him. Um, could you look after them? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. I knew, I knew of them. I didn't know exactly what they were like, or I wouldn't have said yes, but um, I knew of them. Uh, so they were all coming down 
um, I think it was a, it was a Sunday. I met them up Sunday afternoon. They were signing. Uh, they were playing a gig at the I think it was a um, Shepherd's Bush Empire, Hammersmith Apollo. I can't remember which one. With Baby Shambles on the Monday, and on the Monday morning they were all signing the publishing deal. And I think they were getting around about two hundred grand each. Eight. Yeah, oh, it was a no. huge publishing deal they got. So they were there. And they were about maybe 17, 18, 18, 19, maybe, maybe 18, 19, all about to get six figure checks in their bank account the next day and then play their big biggest ever gig. And kind of like, unfortunately for them, they arrived in London on a Sunday and not a Friday or a Saturday night. But if anyone has heard any stories about The View, they would know that that would not stop The View <laughs> having, having a night out. Um, so I, I, I met them about lunchtime, we had a few pints, I took them round about, showed them where everything was, and they asked me if I'd stay out for a bit. I said, yeah, sure. I said, but you know, I'll probably have to head off about one or two o'clock. Um, so it was about one or two o'clock. I'd been out for about 10 hours with them. I had had enough in terms of drinking. They were just getting started. Um, we were in Brixton because we were going to stay at a friend's in, uh, stay at a friend's in Brixton before they went over to sign the deal. I left them at one or two. Uh, in, the, in the morning got to the gig the following night and their manager had come down for the gig he'd, he'd been able to get down for the gig so I went there I said hi hey, mate how you doing he said what the fuck did you do in my band last night I said what do you mean I left them at like one and two and they were absolutely fine he said well the um the drummer was bitten by a, a drug dealer's rottweiler in Brixton and I thought, okay, the drummer, that's not too, if it's a guitarist, but it's a drummer, he's probably okay. And I was like, fuck, I don't, I don't know what happened. And he said, and then one of the other members of the band was mugged, but he was mugged twice in Brixton. And right. um, he'd, he'd been mugged and then he'd gone back to the, so like four or five in the morning in Brixton. I don't know what they were up to. He'd been mugged. He'd left he'd gone back to the house to get some breakfast money for his breakfast he'd come out he started chatting to a couple of guys in the street and he said to them you know can i get you breakfast because i've had a really shitty night i've just been mugged and they were like all oh, right okay and then they pulled a knife on him and nicked the money from him that he was going to buy them breakfast with okay, so yeah. i got i got i got to the gig and um you know kind of like i thought all hell had like broken loose when i when i'd gone home and that the band were were just going to kind of like completely disown me and would just hate me. And then I saw the band and be like, oh, Willie, what a fantastic night we had last <laughs> night. You know, and, and and that was it. And, fr and from uh, after that, we went out with them. Um, we went out with uh, Pete Dockerty, the rest of the Baby Shambles. Um, and we went out with with The View again. And I think the next morning I, I had food, I had alcohol poisoning. I just couldn't <laughs> do, I could not do two days in a row drinking with them. And I remember Pete Dockerty looking at The View as if to say, you guys have just taken it up another <laughs> level from, from where we were. I mean, and they, of all of the band, you know, you, you'll hear lots of stories about that band, um, but very few people will say that they weren't the most rock and roll band that they'd ever come across. And they were absolutely, they were insatiable, but they were, they were a really, really nice uh, group of guys. And, you know, I was, I, I think they should have done better than they did, but, you know, signing such a big deal so early on was 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 really difficult for them to maintain that because you know when when a label puts so much money into a young band at the start they're desperate to get it back and if it doesn't recoup quickly then they just lose interest and, and that's what happened with them unfortunately yeah we had kyle on here a couple of years ago now but yeah yeah i didn't really like doing the research i didn't actually realize it had five albums out yeah i was yeah. like wow i didn't hear about a few of them and then even one was produced by Albert Hammond Jr. and stuff. So they've kept they've kept in there. But yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, and he's done some solo stuff as well now, which is which yeah. is really, which is really good. Um, but yeah, they you know they just unfortunately they just didn't have that support over a longer period of time. Um, and it was great sitting with them and Kel was sitting in his his book open and just writing you know just writing songs when we were out and about. It was they, they were absolutely at the peak. Um, you know, despite them being so young, but you know, I'm, you know, even even the story of how they got uh, how they got on the radar of the of the labels was amazing. Just you know, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you know this, but um, um, Baby Shambles were playing a gig. At, I think it was Fat Sam's in Dundee, and the band just basically camped outside. They were invited in. They played three songs, and. Pete Doherty said, "You're one of the best bands I've ever heard. Can you come and play with us next month?" And yeah, it was it was that kind of it was those stories that I think keep so many bands 
interested and keen in the music industry because that can happen you know but of the 250 bands that we had a kind of relationship with that happened once you know yeah. but it does it does it, it does happen and you know they were a really special band um at that early period in their career for sure i had a good night out at fat sam's once when the panintons played all oh, right yeah yeah <laughs> see that's that's you know D- dundee's a very you know a very different a very different scene but a really good city no, that was great. And yeah, you mentioned you were editor of Music Week. Is that right? What? No, I, I'm, I, my best friend, uh, Ben, uh, right. Ben Cardew, is editor of Music Week. Um, and it was actually him. He's he's an avid listener of the show. So he told me about it a few months ago and I listened to some of the episodes. Um, but he's um, he, he's actually just written a book on, um, I've got it over there, on uh, Daft Punk. So oh, okay. he's like he's he's just a, a huge kind of music brain. So I wasn't surprised to see that he was in this period as much as he was Daft, Daft Punk and and he runs um, Primavera Sound Radio in Barcelona. Oh, so, amazing! So, so he's over here now. Yeah. So we better say hello to Ben because he's he is a big <laughs> fan of your show. Ah, oh, nice one. Appreciate that. And and just say Ben just to make sure I didn't say I was music editor in case you got <laughs> trying it on. No, that was my fault. Um. So what happened then? Like how? Did you kind of gravitate away from the whole A and R thing? And at what point did that happen? Yeah, um, I th- I th- we we had four we had four people in the music company. Uh, there was myself, Dylan, a guy called Billy, a guy called Malcolm, and we we after after about a year, it looked like half of the half of the company wanted to take a, a different approach to A and R than the other half. And 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 uh, Ma- Malcolm and Billy were much more about networking and heading out and getting drunk and building up the bands and things like that. And we were much more about kind of musicality and really developing the bands and giving them support and and paying for recordings and things like that. So our our music company kind of just started to break away. Um, And when we, when we split in 2000 and 2007, um, Billy and Malcolm took over a band, one of the bands were called the Fight Blues, who were a Scottish band, who were a bit kind of like Kasabian, like, um, and they tried to manage them for a few months and then it just petered out and we kept going with uh, Dutch uncles eventually getting them, uh, pushing them towards the uh, Memphis Industries uh, deal, which we didn't sign. Um, they signed that themselves or with a, with a new manager. So we just kind of, after maybe three years doing it full time, I was in my early, my late 20s, early 30s then. And it was, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to make uh, a living or have a career um, and I think the industry is a fantastic place in your 20s but when you start getting you know you're thinking about a family and getting a car and all those types of things so both of both myself and, and Dylan the other half of the, the company we went back to our old jobs Dylan's selling insurance and me organizing events so it was an easy it was an easy transition I must say I missed it for a few years and I tried to help out the odd band now and again um, there was an American band called Grand Rondi um, who came over um, for, for a tour and I was asked to support them and I took them down to the Great Escape in Brighton and we set up some meetings and things like that. But it was always, it became a bit of being on, this, on, the, on the side rather than, uh, rather than what we were trying to do. But we just realised how incredibly tough it was. And I think I always thought, thought like as a manager, you can spend all your time with one band and they don't make it. You can just go and get another band and try it with them. But when you're in a band, you've only really got one chance. Mm. You know, maybe you can reinvent yourself. You know, someone like something like the Kaiser Chiefs. You know, maybe you can just do this kind of Phoenix from the Fire thing and just get an amazing deal. But it was it was really really difficult. Yeah, so it was a it was a real kind of lifestyle and, and career decision to you know to to try and find a for want of a better word a proper job. Um, yeah. outside, outside, the, outside the industry and at that time a lot of the A&R guys that we'd known who hadn't signed bands had left and there was a lot younger people coming in and it was all the relationships that we'd spent two or three years building up the head of A&R and, and, and A&R guys they'd all gone and it was just a lot newer so you had to kind of start that whole process again but with people who were much younger than you because we were the same age as the A&R so yes yeah, so it was a very natural um, progression, I think, for us to move in, try our best, and then and then move out again. So, how do you reflect on it? Is there anything that stands out that you do differently, or anything? Um, that that's 
that's that's a really good question. I think I would be more forceful with the bands that we got offers for, from from majors. For for I think I would be more forceful, and I would say to them that you know they were they really were going to regret this if they didn't do it. And I, I maybe it might not have led to where they wanted, and maybe it might not have led to where we wanted. But I definitely think that we would have helped them by getting them to at least take a punt on seeing where it is with a, with, with a major label. But no, looking back, um, and it was actually um, Ben who we spoke about a minute ago, he said that he knows hundreds of managers and he doesn't know many who'd got an, an offer for almost all of their bands. You know, so uh, we, we, we felt f- pretty proud that we managed to get that over that period of time. So uh, I wouldn't really have um, any... No, I wouldn't really do anything different. Well, I wouldn't know that I would do anything different that would make a difference because, yeah. you know, obviously if I'd gone to see Arctic Monkeys before they were signed <laughs> or anything like that, it is completely different. But no, we're pr- pretty happy where, you know, pretty happy where h- how we, you know, how, how, how much we were able to enjoy that really, really good time for, for British music. And what about now? Like how, how, dif- how different is it now for A&R? Like obviously we spoke to bands who kind of explained and how the money is different in terms of the internet and everything. Is it is it just a case of money that's changed it? Well, when, when we were, I mean, 2005 was almost a pivotal year for having a band because it was um, when we signed with Beggars, um, Beggars Banquet, when they signed Dead Fly Bukowski, it was, we signed one of the first contracts that covered more than the recording. So Beggars were looking to say, we need a little bit of your merchandising. We need a little bit of any other income that's coming in um, because we have to start paying for this advance. And we realise that, you know, um, we're only going to pay you less amount of tour support, but eventually we're going to have to get a percentage of what you're making on tour for our label to survive. So the, the first, the deal that I negotiated with with for, for um, Dead Fly Bukowski was one of the first um, multi-revenue record contracts that was signed in the UK. So it was just at that point where it became about revenue streams outside of record sales. And so that was a really interesting time. And, you know, a couple of years later, um, when we were ending, you were looking at maybe 27 to 30 different streams, uh, revenue streams that the record label was looking to recoup its investment from. So it really changed. It properly, properly became digital. But was it? The money, it was always about money. a and mm. always been about money. As long as there's been A&R men, um, it's been about money. So I don't think, I don't think that's changed um, too much. I mean, what we really noticed was 10 years later, no one that we knew in the record labels were still there, apart from Alan McGee, <laughs> who was still being Alan McGee, but everyone else had left. And that, I think, was a big change because I think a lot of those older A&R guys had grown up or had their formative career going to gigs and seeing bands. And it really changed with the, you know, with, with MySpace at the time in 2005 and then much more in digital world. So a and is still at heart the same job, but I think it's a very different process now. I mean, it's so much easier when I was doing a if you wanted to see 10 bands, if you wanted to hear 10 bands, you had to go to three gigs. You know, now you can listen to a hundred bands and and an hour, even when you were a record, even when you were a record label, um, you know, your your pile of CDs ran out if you wanted to sit and go through them. Where now it's just kind of a, you know just a, a, an unending amount of music, which is not necessarily a good thing for anyone, really. Mm-hmm. You mentioned Alan McGee. Then did you have uh, any type of relationship with him? Yeah, um, uh, I, I'm, I met Alan a few times. Um, he, I ran a club, uh, it was called M6M1 in Islington Academy for about six months and it was kind of like a Britpop revival um, and um, I'd met Alan a couple of times and he came to DJ for me and it was just after he'd been introduced to his son so he didn't know that he'd had a, a, a son until I think his son was about 18 or 19 and he was at our gig and he'd only met him a couple of days before and he was just saying how incredible it was because he went to meet his son and then he went to his flat and he was looking through his music collection and I remember him saying he said it was like my little boy had stolen my my music collection <laughs> and put it in his house we were so similar and it was just really interesting because I, I I didn't meet the Alan McGee of the of the 90s I met someone who didn't drink 
and who was really family orientated and it was really interesting having that kind of relationship with him when he was a completely different person but seeing him kind of get all excited about having a family and you know being a lot a lot um not having many nice things to say about the music industry by that point um was was really in, was a really interesting you know few times that I, I was able to spend some time with him he was a, he, and he was a really a really really nice guy and he was he, you know he, he was really keen to help and he, he especially he, he definitely had a soft spot for bands from Scotland and we were able to get our bands to play at his club out in um I can't remember what it was called now um, but he had a, he had a weekly club like a Tuesday night, and he would always put our bands on because they were they were they were Scottish bands. <laughs> so you know, I think he's always kind of had that. Um, but at the time, you know, he was still hugely influential. Um, and you know, if you think about what he did with the horrors, and you know, it, it, he was still just really able to to help those bands out at that period of time. I'm not sure what he's up to now. I've not I've not seen much of him in the last few years. I think he's got something called another type of creation records he's got going. Right. a few bands but yeah we had him on here a while ago it's it very good to chat to him yeah <laughs> yeah 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 he's someone who couldn't he couldn't leave the music industry behind it's yeah. absolutely in his blood you know in his in his veins yeah i was saying that to him because in his book he kind of finishes him saying you know he's washed his hands in the music industry and then by the time we were speaking to him he was well back in there yeah yeah, yeah. well that's it out, out the door and then 30 minutes later he's 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 back in again yeah all right mate i think that's yeah that's covered everything really from my point of view is there anything else that you think we've missed or anything um no i think it's it's, it's been good to um uh, bring back bring back some memories um but yeah I, I think i think the bands of that period are underrated um you know and, and i hope that I hope that you know the stuff that you're doing, and as as we get on a lot of it, people will revisit a lot of the bands from that period of time and realise how 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 good they were, but also how original they were. And I think a lot of those bands don't get a lot of credit for being original, um, but I, I, I do think they were doing something very different. And um, it was a yeah, it was a it was a great time. <laughs>